Welcome to Drone TV. I'm your host, Patrick Egan. This is the real kickoff for a new platform from the SUAS News. We hope that this series serves to educate and inspire people about some of the uses for a technology that is undoubtedly going to transform the way we live, work, and play. I am delighted to bring our first guest on, Maha Calderon. She is the creative force behind the Civilian Drone documentary, and at last count has been downloaded over 5,000 times. Maha? Hello, Patrick. How are you? Doing good, and we're glad to have you here today. But before we get started, I want to clarify, and not that I'm trying to distance myself, but the, for the reason of proper attribution. I had no part in making this film besides me being interviewed. And with that said, this film is raising a lot of eyebrows. Why? The first person to be a little bit annoyed with this was uh, someone from Homeland Security. <laughs> And uh, his biggest objection was that we were making the FAA look bad. People just do not want us talking about the subject. I, I would agree. And I was uh, approached by that same gentleman at the uh, Small Unmanned Systems Business Expo. And, and I will agree with that. You know, oh, we're working on this and there's, there's something that we need to do here. And uh, there's a lot of work and there's good people there and we're working. And nobody's really denying that there's good people at the FAA or people are working or whatever. But I mean, you know... Uh, when you talk about this length of time and, and, and the lack of progression, I think it's fair in the public rulemaking uh, process to be public about the public rulemaking process. Agree? Disagree? Absolutely. I mean, the, the FAA works for us after all, and I think people kind of lost sight of that. I know that this work or film is being passed around and forwarded all over D.C. through DOT, FAA, and bouncing off of all five sides of the Pentagon. Yet there appears to be an effort to kind of downplay or, or, or distance, uh, people are trying to distance themselves from the video. Uh, and what, what have you heard? Everybody is behind us. Everybody gives us their full support. Just don't mention any names. So, so that's kind of the, 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 the wider obstacle to distribution is that people are afraid of retribution. What, like they're not going to get a COA or, or they're not going to get some kind of um, special dispensation or something from the FAA? It seems to be understood that if you are working with the FAA, if you're in line to get a COA, then you are going to have problems. Hmm, that's interesting, and I, I, I you know, I've, I've been a little, uh, I've been subject to a little bit of that myself, but, you know, I figured that was kind of an isolated thing. All right, well, besides the people who are feel, fearful of retribution, what, what's the general public saying? What is the community saying about this film? What's their feedback, Ma? Well, the general public has no idea that this is even happening, and the first response or feedback is, why is this happening, and why are we not aware of it? So you think that there's, um, let's say, a lack of objective information in this community and in the search and rescue community? I think people think when someone is lost or in need of help that any possible resource is dispatched. Unless it's an unmanned aircraft, then you can't use it. Interesting, because, you know, the feedback I'm hearing from the film in the community, I mean, I'm pretty... Uh, connected to the community. I talk to a lot of people, and I'm paraphrasing uh, for brevity, but m most people say, you know, I watch for 10 minutes, and uh, this film, I, I get so pissed off, you know, that I want to pick up the phone, and I want to call either my congressperson or someone at the FAA. Um, why is this happening? And then by kind of the end of the film, they're a little depressed. They find it depressing as they, they feel that the system is broken, and the FAA is woefully ineffectual in this case. The film was not scripted. This is just to let you know this is what's happening now. And people do need to step in and help out because we can't do it without the whole public support. Right, to get that message out there, I would Correct. agree. So that, you know, that leads me to my next question. How was the film received by AUVSI? Is, is Unmanned Systems Magazine doing a, a, a story on, on the film? Oh, AVSI could not be involved with us because they're trying to stay in a positive relationship with the FAA, and they kind of hinted that the movie wasn't exactly positive. Really? Uh, that's kind of interesting. So have you, and that was kind of the official reason? They, they just want to stay in the good graces of the FAA and they don't want to rock the boat? That is correct. Hmm. That's pretty interesting. Well, that's really too bad and, and a little confusing as, you know, they've hired a PR firm and put up a website to purportedly highlight the positive uses of this technology. 
But, you know, maybe in this case, finding lost people and lost children isn't positive enough. Um, I don't know. I think I may have warned you, though, during the course of making this film, that there are people who, you know, let's say, don't want to upset the status quo. Either they make their living or their, you know, job or whatever. Let's say they're fearful about their jobs instead of trying to help this industry go um, and grow. It's a, I guess I, I maybe you know speaking up and and exposing uh, some of this dysfunction. Uh, they're afraid will be done at their own expense. Who's really going to represent you? We thought maybe a UVSI would, but we were wrong. Hmm. Well, you know, uh, hopefully they'll. Uh, come to, to understand what's at stake. But I kind of feel uh, that, you know, we've been in this situation for, uh, since February 13th of 2007. And I know that uh, personally, you know, the people that I'm concerned about with this technology are the people that are like, to, you know, trying to feed their families, pay their mortgages, run a small business. And um, I, I think that uh, the film is effective in showing the plight of, say, an application where not only could someone make a, a living providing this service, they could also help you know, humankind and find lost and missing people. One thing that I, I really enjoyed about this is that you were able to kind of capture some of the personalities and uh, emotional responses, which is, is really kind of an art. So maybe you could set up the, uh, the first clip for us. We just try to get all the kids off the street. They, there's kids, they run away because they're trying to find some place to go to be safe and they are not educated on what is out there and what can happen to them. He's talking about finding lost children. Of course, what they try to do is step up in the community and talk to children and kind of tell them, okay, if this day should come, if you are lost, this is what you do. And it kind of ties in really nicely with what Gene Robinson is doing with his aircraft, which is to find lost children. But what if there was that one time that something happened to some little kid or even me and they got, they fell off a cliff, they got lost. There's so many things that could happen and our resources aren't able to reach those people. There's nothing I would love more than to see a drone coming to get me. Thank, Thank you, Jean. One thing that you brought out in this film is, is is Tim Miller, and not only him, but uh, some of the other people, but you were able to really uh, make these people comfortable and open up to you. And, you know, Tim uh, is able to genuinely, you can see the emotion, and you can see he's being really real, but he's a little bit of a colorful guy. What were the more uh, colorful, let's say, things that he said? As you know, Patrick, Tim's daughter, Laura, was missing for 17 months and this clip highlights his frustration with a system that's broken. Charles Manson would escape from the penitentiary and would have found my daughter, he'd be my hero. I wouldn't have gave a damn who found Laura. And we've got the politicians in Washington that are wearing their $2,000 suits in there and cannot make a decision. Oh, definitely a, a heart-wrenching experience. I mean, I, I, I hope to God I'm never in anything like that because I don't even know if I could take it. So another gentleman that you interviewed in uh, uh, the course of making this documentary uh, was uh, Officer Ken DeFore. Uh, you know, I would, I would call him uh, old school. I know that he wears a badge. He's a masterpiece officer, straight shooter, down to earth, uh, has a lot of good things to say. What, what, was, what were some of the more uh, impressionable things that he said to you? Well, Patrick, Captain DeFore is a prior captain at the Houston Police Department Helicopter Division. He was division commander there. He's currently captain at the Liberty County Sheriff Department and member of Texas EquiSearch. So Captain DeFour really has a seasoned pilot's perspective on drones. Having been a helicopter pilot myself, I can understand some reservations that helicopter pilots or fixed-wing pilots may have in regards to drones. Flying into restricted airspace, flying into an area where the manned aircraft is located, but just like the federal aviation laws apply to manned aircraft, they could apply equally to drone aircraft. I believe people who oppose these are either uninformed or misinformed about their outstanding qualities and how they can support law enforcement and the general public. You have a lot of interesting characters. 
But one of them that really stands out is the uh, co-host of the SUS News podcast series, uh, Mr. Gene Robinson. What, what, was it, what was your first impression of Gene Robinson coming on the scene? The fact that he has not given up after all this time. Uh, Gene Robinson is like Superman. You know, here he comes to save the day. When nobody else can find you, Gene can. And people are going out of their way from government agencies to stop him. Yeah, it's, it's, it's truly sad. And Gene, uh, my hat's off to Gene. Uh, he really has had to overcome so much uh, adversity, which we could go into if this was a mini-series. But uh, <laughs> he's a good guy. My hat's off to him. You know, keep up the good work, Gene Robinson. So one of the other uh, people involved in this, the, the creative force and the dynamic duo here, is uh, Gus Calderon. I want to bring Gus on. Gus? Thank you, Patrick. Thank you for having me. Of course, uh, we're happy to have you here. But, you know, uh, there's been a lot of, let's say, chatter and static going back and forth. It's some email traffic and telephone calls and whatever else. People are like, oh, you know, this is, um, you know, Gus's movie and, and Maha's movie and, and Patrick's movie or blah, blah, blah. And, um, you know, if you could, could you, could you kind of parse out who the players are and uh, the mechanics of how this came about? We were going to do a documentary about all of the applications of civilian drones um, and, and their beneficial purposes. But there was so much negative media attention about drones around that time, we decided just to pursue uh, one, of the, one of the main and most important uses of this technology, which is search and rescue. Well, you guys did an excellent job. And, and when the clip was shown at the uh, SUASXB Expo, the business expo, <clears throat> and just the emotion that it evoked out of people, just the clip right there, I knew you guys had a winner on your hands. I would agree that, you know, uh, there, there are some uh, negative connotations around drones, and I think it's kind of an education thing. But so, you know, what kicked off, let's say, the, 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 the change of tact from doing something wider on, on, or broader on drones and then moving to search and rescue? Well, it's an interesting question. And actually, there was a serendipitous event, if you will, but uh, my wife just happened to coincidentally be sitting next to Gene Robinson's wife, Angelique, on a Southwest Airlines flight from Austin back to San Diego, and they started just talking. And uh, they both realized that, uh, that their husbands are working in the unmanned industry. And I was picking up Maha at the airport, and she said, you're not going to believe who, who I sat next to. And, and I had heard of Gene Robinson at that time. So uh, I met Angelique, and, and Gene was actually coming to town uh, that weekend for a family event. And so uh, once we met, uh, it was, we really hit it off, uh, started a friendship, and, and we realized that the more we heard about his story, I, he, I read his book, First to Deploy, uh, the more I learned about that and the more I got to, knew, to know Gene, I, I, I realized that we really did need to focus this film uh, on Gene and on Search and Rescue, which is, which is what we did. You know, life is amazing sometimes like that. You know, some just total random uh, event happens, and then what comes out of that? Excellent, excellent backstory on that. Um, for you, Gus, it, it, what what part of this film really stuck out? Or, you know, what what made the lasting impression on you? Working with, with Gene and, and seeing his dedication has, has made a very, very strong impression on me. And uh, his dedication to what he's doing and, and standing up for what he believes in and, and demonstrating leadership. I think, I think that's something that's really lacking in this industry. Uh, even though there are large lobbying groups, as we've discussed out there, AUVSI and um, this industry is lacking leadership. I would agree. We're in, we're in a short supply of people who stand up for what they mm -hmm. believe in, and, and Gene Robinson's mm -hmm. definitely one of those people. Anything else that you'd like to add uh, from your perspective um, that you've learned from making this film? I was honestly really surprised at how many people have distanced themselves from this film after initially showing support. Um, and... I think eventually history will show that some people will be on the wrong side of the history and other people will be on the right side of history. Overall, what, what do you really hope uh, 
let's say, comes out of the effort of making this film. I hope that this film inspires people to think of other applications of unmanned aircraft uh, to, for humanitarian purposes. Well, there's plenty of examples in the film of people to emulate uh, and, and, and go forward and maybe get involved in this community. Was that, was that kind of planned or did it just kind of happen that way? No, that just kind of happened that way. And honestly, the more we got to know Gene and the more I got to see how he operated, what really impressed me is his professional approach to using unmanned aircraft. There are a lot of people out there who are using this technology. But Gene, not only has he written the book about using unmanned aircraft for search and rescue, but he follows written procedures. He has safety protocols in place. And I think that's, that's again, reflect, a reflection upon his leadership. Well, I, I, I think you're hitting on some real uh, good points. And I, and I think that people miss that. I mean, a lot of people in this community or they get interested in this uh, unmanned aircraft technology are not really aviation people. I mean, even myself included. But, you know, you're, you're going to have to understand, and we, we talk about this a lot, that there's, a, there's already people in the space. And we're entering a space that's already, uh, let's say, populated, and we have to be good neighbors moving into that. And that is going to take some rules, uh, some best practices, some standards, things like that. And uh, I think that what you're saying um, will probably, it does come across in the film and needs to be talked about more in the future. And I hope that uh, future work that you guys do on, on films also stress and, uh, that point and people understand kind of what's at stake for all of us. Now, you know, I've heard some other people say, um, or let's say their reviews of the film, and thank God they're not doing uh, reviews for commercial film, but they'll say, you know, oh, you know, the message in this film is, is people are dying and it's the FAA's fault. I didn't get that personally. That's not what I heard. But, uh, you know, I, I don't really feel like that was the point of the movie. The FAA has been doing an outstanding job managing commercial airline safety. In fact, this does not get enough media attention, especially since 911. Uh, the, the number of fatalities has been incredibly low uh, domestically, and, and a, you know, a great amount of thanks goes to the FAA for the efforts that they've done uh, for maintaining airline safety in this country. Now, my only wish is that they could take some of that, whatever they're doing correctly there, and just apply that to the to their efforts in the unmanned aircraft uh, industry. I, and I know where you're going with that. I mean, you know, you're, you're trying to give uh, people their due. And, you know, to be fair, too, I mean, I'm you know, some people are like, that, that, that Egan guy just hates the FAA. He thinks everything they do is screwed up. No, that's not true. Um, and I realize, you know, it's a bureaucracy, but I know, you know, there are people that work there and they're good people and they're trying to get their job done and there's funding issues and whatever um, that prevent them from doing that. And there's also political issues. I mean, you know, um, in the FAA, you know, I, I don't think there's anybody there that's just like, hey, I want to do this today. Okay, sounds good. Do whatever you want. Give me a call next week. So there, there are channels that you got to work through. Um, I understand that. But I, I, I think that you know, even after watching the film and talking to people, there's, uh, let's say, I think we're justified in our frustration. Some people say, well, you know, you're just frustrated because, you know, it's not happening fast enough. Well, yeah, p partially true. I mean, you know, we have something where we should have had some action. This has almost been going on for about 10 years, and we should have had some action, and we've got nothing. And that's just because there's not the will to make this happen or the budget. And also, the community does uh, bear some of the blame. So don't, you know, think that we, I just paint them with this broad brush, you know, hate the FAA and, you know, throw darts at their collective picture or whatever. That's not what happens. We do understand there are good people, and we, and we want to uh, say thank you to those people and the efforts that are made. Absolutely. And, and I have very close friends who work in the FAA, and also Maha has some friends who've worked for air traffic control. And uh, they've, they've seen the film, and, and they actually agree with the message in the film. And honestly, a lot of them have told us off camera that uh, they are frustrated with how things happen in Washington or how they don't happen in Washington. So, you know, at the local level, uh, you know, there's some very, very hardworking people doing excellent work, but I'm not sure what happens uh, over in Washington. 
this is causing uh, my business to basically not grow at all. And it's doing the same for a lot of other businesses too. And it's really a shame in this economy where there's, there's so much opportunity and, and there's so many bright minds who are available, who, who have approached me and say, hey, I can help you out with your business. And it's so sad when I tell them that I, I just, I'm sorry, I don't have the revenue or the income right now to hire you. Uh, honestly, the, the, the business, the very, very small business that, that I have, Isis Copter, could be significantly larger uh, if there were just some basic rules in place or if there were some type of exemption for commercial use of aircraft, uh, unmanned aircraft below a certain weight. Uh, so it's, it's really been frustrating and that's why we're having to spend a lot of our time and effort uh, on the uh, UAS advocacy side. To well, I agree with that. And, you know, that was one thing. And uh, back in 2007, I had this business going and, you know, the decree took my business away from me. It freed up all this spare time where I could do this advocacy and write letters to the FAA and, you know, follow them around and ask them questions, which I know they enjoy. We're all good friends down there. Um, you know, I, I think you make some great points. You know, everybody talks about the economy and, and jobs and everything else. And this technology uh, represents a, let's say, it represents a disruptive technology that I think could really uh, give us a, a technology that could give us a shot in the arm in the economy. And uh, it's just real, a real shame that uh, our government has, let's say, changed its focus from helping the people to hindering the people. But that's all I'm going to say on that. All one needs to do is look abroad. I mean, there are many countries that currently allow commercial use of this technology and they're not having any problems uh, with their manned aviation operations or companies or countries like Japan and Canada, which, which have flourishing uh, industries right now. And unfortunately, this is going to put the United States, uh, you know, behind because a lot of this development is being stifled because of the current restrictions. And I've just heard an interesting uh, statistic on that. Uh, as of late, there are about, there's 1,100 plus uh, legal operators in Europe. In the United States, we got two. And those are uh, DOD systems. In situ, Scan Eagle and AeroVironment Puma. It's ridiculous. Yeah, I agree with you. And there are a lot of conspiracy theorists out there. And, and we do get letters from people who imply that there's some type of relationship between the FAA and the defense contractors. We don't know anything about that, but there are a lot of people who've, who've kind of raised that, um, that issue. And uh, that's something that maybe needs to be explored in the future. Well, when the standards come out, the proof will be in the pudding. You know, and it goes right back to the two operators that I just talked about. You know, got two programs there that came out of the DOD, rubber stamped, and those people are allowed to fly. I know that you're a certificated uh, pilot. The, the one thing that I've noticed is it's the people like you who've actually complied with the law and aren't flying, and the people that don't know anything about the NAS are the ones that are out there going nuts. Do you, you care to uh, address that? Yeah, that's a very good point. And honestly, I cannot even keep track of the number of offers uh, I've turned down from Paramount Studios, from other companies, production companies, uh, who've asked me to do aerial filming and to pay me, and I've had to turn them down. And because I, I basically, you know, being an FAA licensed commercial pilot, I am concerned. Uh, about possible retribution. And so I, uh, you know, again, as a pilot, I've been taught to follow and obey the regulations, which, which I've been doing. And it's unfortunately to my detriment. And I do see a lot of other people doing operations out there. A lot of them, mo most of them, do not have the training that I have for safety, et cetera, yet they're out there, they're making money, and, and, and they're, they're their, some of their businesses are actually flourishing. And so it's really uh, frustrating and upsetting to see that going on um, while I'm obeying the laws and, and trying to do things the right way. Well, yeah, and it definitely, um, I've tried to express this to the FAA before. It's like, well, you know, someday we'll have regulations and you'll be able to jump back out there and do this. True. True enough, I will, but what I will be doing is I will be trying to gain market share from a guy who's been doing it for the last five, six years. 
and I got to buy all the equipment again, and I got to, you know, do the steep learning curve and get out there, and I'm at this severe disadvantage. So the regulatory thing, basically, I said, when I think about it, I'm following the law, and you see everybody else make money, I feel like a real chump. Is that how we're supposed to feel about federal regulations, is if I follow the regulations, I'm a chump? I don't think that was really the, uh, the point of the putting that, that whole federal government together. No, I agree with you completely. It brings to mind the saying, nice guys finish last. It's, it's really unfortunate that it's come to this. And I really hope that there's some type of re resolution soon. Um, honestly, from what I see is uh, the influx of these systems into this country is far greater than anybody can even imagine. There are some systems that are very easy to operate, the DJI Phantom. There are other smaller multi-rotors. These are coming in by the, I don't even know, thousands, Outload. tens of thousands are coming over in <laughs> huge, you know, ships from, from overseas. And, and, and people are using these right now. And you can get a complete system off the shelf that's easy to fly for five or six hundred dollars. And people are out there starting their own businesses. How in the world is, is anybody in the government going to be able to, to stop this? What are they going to do about that? You know, sometimes uh, we, we, we talk about all of this, and, and sometimes I, I, I want to, or I hope, and this has always been an ongoing problem, is, is that the people at the FAA and the people that support them, and even the, the DOD vendors, the thing that, that has always, uh, let's say, caused trepidation for me is that most of the people that are involved in this, this effort uh, have no experience with this technology. And uh, even when I was on the ARC and other things, and I'd talk about that, I would say, well, you know, who here has run a business? You know, who here knows how I operate my business? And uh, the answer was always, uh, you know, shaking their heads and nobody really knew what was going on. Um, I'm hoping that changes, but I, I really feel like uh, from a regulatory standpoint of view, we're at a real disadvantage. I believe that, that more people from the industry, especially on the small unmanned side, need to be involved uh, from the regulatory side and also with with the main lobbying uh, group with AUVSI they are the the primary lobbying voice for this industry and my my hope is that that we can uh, generate more of a discussion and that they will include more and more people with industry background uh, because that's absolutely critical uh, from a leadership perspective and to and to move the industry forward they really need to have on board uh, people with industry experience, people who have been running a business, and uh, I think uh, maybe that's missing right now. I don't know, but uh, I would like to uh, open up a line of communication with them, and if there's any way that, that we can help, we'd be glad to, to give ideas. Or I'd concur with that. A lot of people that are in this industry that are, are supposedly advocating for the industry have no idea what they're talking about. They've never run a business, never written a check, never operated, never flown. Um, so what that does do is it does put the responsibility of advocating on to the community and the community needs to speak up and advocate for yourself. And I would suggest you get on the horn and call the FAA, um, call everyone involved and say, Hey, you know what? I don't, uh, I don't think this is happening fast enough for me. I'm tired of excuses. I want to get the thing rolling. Speak up for yourself because at the end of the day, you're speaking about your future. And hopefully platforms like this, platforms like Drone TV, will uh, allow the message to get out there and to reach more people. So I really wish you the best of luck with this new venture, Patrick, and hopefully you, this gives you a platform to, to reach more people and to, uh, so that they have a better understanding of the technology. Appreciate that, guys. That's what we're trying to do here at SUS News is, is become or give the community a voice. We hope that you enjoyed the first episode of Drone TV. Please feel free to drop us a line at SUS News to tell us your thoughts and maybe some ideas for future episodes. Again, I'm Patrick Egan, and I want to, uh, and everyone at SUS News Group, thanks you for watching.
Thank you.